Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm the current president of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. I am also the founder and owner of a company called Humanist Learning Systems. And I would like to welcome you to today's Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. My co-host is Elizabeth, who's going to be our next president. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Castillo. Um, I'm at Arizona State University. I study and teach organizational leadership, and I'm currently the secretary and now soon incoming president of the U.S. chapter of International Humanistic Management Association. Thank you for being here today. We're so excited. Our guest today we are also excited about is Mary Beth Gassman. She's the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Endowed Chair in Education a distinguished professor and the Associate Dean for Research in the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University. She also serves as the Executive Director of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity and Justice, and the Executive Director of the Rutgers Centers for Minority Serving Institution. She's the Chair of the Rutgers University New Brunswick Facility Faculty Council, and prior to joining the faculty at Rutgers, Mary Beth was the Judy and Howard Berkowitz Endowed Professor in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Her areas of expertise include the history of American higher education, minority serving institutions with an emphasis on the historic black colleges and universities, racism and diversity, fundraising and philanthropy, and higher education leadership. She's the author and editor of 33 books. The most recent one is how Doing the Right Thing, How to End Systemic Racism in Faculty Hiring out from uh, Princeton University last year. Welcome, Mary Beth. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. All thank right, you. you ready to get started? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to get started. Um, let me just, I'm, I'm just gonna share my screen. And all right, so um, things. Um, I uh, well, I'm really glad to be here. I'm I'm just going to chat for about 15 minutes and then open it up to questions. Um, so just a little bit of background. Most of what I'm going to say is going to pertain to kind of like practical approaches that um, I uh, have identified or um, as a result of the research I did for this book. So just to let you know a little bit about the book process. Um, you know, most of my work over my career of being a professor for 25 years at this point um, has not focused on systemic racism in faculty hiring. And in fact, um, as you heard from the bio, the majority of my work really pertains to minority serving institutions or um, more specifically historically black colleges, but but minority serving institutions in the country in general. And, you know, I, I didn't start doing uh, research in this area. I'd been doing a lot of practice um, because I feel really strongly that it's important that we have a diverse faculty in the, in the country and beyond actually internationally as well. Um, but I, uh, I, I ended up writing this book because I was mad. I was mad at everything that I kept seeing. I was mad at... Um, just blatant forms of systemic racism that I was seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I spoke up about it, oftentimes people would either one, ignore me, send me a message after meetings and say, thank you for speaking up. I really admire you, which by the way, doesn't do any good. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just, I just watched people see systemic racism happening in real time, but choose to ignore it and move move in another direction. And in the book, I talk about some really, really heinous kinds of things that happened um, that I, some of which I, I saw and some of which I have, have been relayed to me. So, um, and a couple things, you know, this book is written as if we were talking in a coffee shop, because I think that's the way that you have to communicate with people in, in, in order to get them to change. But it also is jam packed with data. So it has tons of quantitative data, and it has tons of qualitative data. And the reason why I was interested in approaching it that way is I wanted it to be accessible, but I also wanted it to be able to stand up to um, people who tend to, when they disagree with something about 
uh, diversity or related to systemic racism, they tend to always go after the data sources. I have watched people do this for years. And so I tried my very best to have as many data sources as possible. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, you know, the book is, is, it's a thick book and there's a lot in it, but I'm going to tell you some of the most important things that I feel that um, have uh, come out of the book. And I put them all on one slide just in really short form, but I'll go over them a bit. Um, so if you wanted to take a screenshot, you could. So um, here are some of the things that come out of this book um, that I think people need to do. And you notice that I wrote turning intent into action. And part of the problem that I found with faculty and leaders is that they have the intent, but they will not act on it in most cases. And um, so one of them is, you know, one thing that we can all do is that um, we all say we value diversity. Most of us will say that, but we don't actually consistently communicate that in every setting. So one of the things that anybody who knows me well, and um, Bianca Neal is on here and is one of our visiting scholars at the Institute that I um, I, I lead, um, can, hopefully could attest to this, hi Bianca, and um, is that in every single situation that I find myself in, I'm communicating how important it is that we value diversity in broadly defined, but in this case, racial diversity, right? Because that's really what I'm talking about here today is racial and ethnic diversity. So in every single situation, and so I tell leaders this all the time, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you need to reinforce this idea. Um, faculty also need to do that. And I know we'll probably end up talking more about specific things that you can do, but faculty need to do the same thing. So if you notice something, say something. I think that's Amtrak's uh, um, tagline, right? If you see something, say something. I'm on the East Coast, so we we take Amtrak. But um, it's it's really important to speak up. And what happens so often is that people notice things, talk about it in their small groups, but never bring it to the larger group to be able to be acted on. So I'll, I'll, we can talk more in depth about, about that as well. Um, here's another thing. I talk a lot in this book about faculty search processes, okay? And this could be for other types of searches as well. But in this case, these faculty search processes are run by faculty. And faculty will do this thing where they say, well, I mean, I don't know how to do this. I don't have any training in this, right? And what they fail to do is realize that when they first started their research, they also didn't know what they were doing. And they had to, they had to do research, they had to investigate, they had to, to go out and look for answers. And so one of the things I try to tell people is you have to treat your role as a member of a search committee as you would your research. So that means you've got to do your homework. You've got to figure out, well, what are the best practices? Practices. How should I approach this? What are the things that I should avoid? And, you know, this kind of links to one of the other things on here, which has to do with um, the use of data, right? So I talked to so many faculty department chairs, search committee chairs, deans, provosts, who had no understanding that there's something called the survey of earned doctorates that is done by the National Science Foundation, where you can find out who's producing the most PhDs of, of color in a variety of areas. And you can use that data in order to expand your search pool. You can use that data to set up pipelines with institutions so that you can bring in a more diverse faculty. Now, all this would take is one Google search to find this out. But as I mentioned, most faculty who are participating in these searches and even leaders at institutions are not doing their homework. In my book, I call these individuals lazy. Okay, now when I first put lazy in the book, a couple of my friends who read it early said, ooh, faculty are gonna get mad about that. And I said, that's okay because I actually think it's incredibly lazy to say that you care about diversity and do nothing about it, which is what I see a lot of people within higher education doing. 
Um, I, I, I do want to say using data to promote diversity is really important. Like you have to know your numbers. You need to know the status of your whatever organization that you're working with, right? You need to know the status in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. You need to know the, the percentages in pools. You need to know the percentages in pipelines and all of that connects. And what happens is a lot of times people don't take the time to even look at that data. Um, I found over and over and over and over of all the people I interviewed, I might've run into two leaders who actually use data. Most people were like, well, we kind of throw a wide net and we hope for what we get. And that does that is not a productive way to diversify faculty. In no way does that work, right? You have to be incredibly purposeful. Um, I also recommend using monetary incentives. Sometimes this is controversial, but I'll tell you what I mean. In order to have a diverse faculty, you can incentivize, if you're a provost, you can incentivize deans. You can put having a diverse faculty, recruiting and retaining a diverse faculty in, in an individual's performance evaluation and tie their raises to it. You can do the same thing with department chairs. You can also, this is again, people are sort of shy away from this, but you can also make contributions to diversity, widely defined part of faculty annual evaluations. If you have them, you can build that into tenure. That's something that we're starting to do at Rutgers. I'm very, very proud that as chair of the faculty council, that's one of the things that I push for because I think it's very important, diversity broadly defined, in this case, I'm talking about racial and ethnic diversity. Um, so monetary incentives can be incredibly important. Here's another monetary incentive. Um, if you bring in, you know, if you bring in a diverse faculty, let's say if you brought in a cluster hire of three or four people, maybe the provost office or president's office is willing to pay a third of those individuals salary for the first three years. Those are monetary incentives to have a more diverse faculty. Um, so something that I really, really try to communicate in my book is that the system for hiring faculty in our institutions was designed to attract white men. And that's who it attracts, okay? It hires white men. And you know, systems can be racist. And, and in, in the case of higher education, our systems were, just fundamentally, I'm a historian by training, fundamentally designed for white affluent men. And our faculty systems were designed to attract white men. And so we really have to rethink those systems. And that has to do with rethinking how we define quality. And there's a great book that I recommend to everybody by Lauren Rivera. It's also published by Princeton and it's called Pedigree. And it's not about higher ed, it's more about uh, students graduating from college and, their, and how pedigree is defined in their job search. But it tells you so much about how we as individuals define quality and what she does using a thorough research, um, uh, you know, research initiative is she shows that most of us define quality as us. We define high quality as ourselves. And if the professoriate is 76% white, then that means we keep reproducing within a system that likes to attract whiteness. So, and there's nothing wrong with white, being white. I wanna make sure people realize that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think white guilt does us any good, but we do have to um, face the fact that it is, incredibly important that we have a diverse faculty for our students. Also, because I think it's a moral imperative. I also think it's important because we need to have the best knowledge and the best knowledge comes from a highly diverse professoriate. Um, so I do want to, I want to give you an example of that whole defining quality in our own image. And I'm going to use myself for this. Okay. So if you ask most people, um, what makes a good parent? They will describe themselves more than likely, unless they think they're a horrific parent, most people will define themselves. They'll describe themselves. 
Now, for me, if you ask me what makes a good parent, this is what I would say. Somebody who gives a lot of love and has high expectations, okay? High expectations, a lot of love, and I would probably throw in strict, okay? That's the kind of parent I am. I once overheard my daughter in the kitchen when she didn't think I was home telling her friends, you know, my mom is really strict and she has high expectations, but she really loves me, you know? And, and I thought, oh, and she's like, and I, I, I love that because I, you know, that's the kind of situation that I excel in. So, um, you know, I, so I, I feel like I did a good job. It's not for everybody. And that's probably not how everybody defines being a good parent. I have a really good friend who defines it as let them do what they need to do. That's not me. So, you know, so I, I give you that example because most of us are trying to define quality in our own image. That doesn't work well when we're trying to hire a diverse group of people. We need to uh, have broader definitions of quality that are not linked to a history of whiteness what white people think is high quality. So, you know, that's something I talk a lot about in the book. Happy to answer more questions about that. Two more things that I want to point out that um, come up in the book and that I think are incredibly important. I think if you want to have a diverse faculty and you care about it, and this is even within any organization, if you care about hiring a diverse group of people, you have to be brave. You have to be willing to push back against the typical excuses. And some of the excuses typically are, well, that person didn't go to the right institution. We tend to hire from the same institutions over and over and over and over. Um, and we tend to think that if we don't hire from them, the quality slips. We have no evidence of this. Okay, we, we have no evidence. There's no evidence of this. But we, uh, all of our, you know, us faculty who do research, we don't do any research about this this, but we claim it to be the truth. Um, and then another thing that happens is people will say, well, they'll never come here. There aren't enough people of color here. Well, you don't even give people a chance to make that decision, right? It's not a decision we should make whether or not someone will, is willing to come. We should make an offer and ask people if they're willing to come. And then another one that I want to point out is that often people will say, we can't afford them. But there's so much research that shows that people of color are the least paid. They, they have the lowest salaries in the academy. Occasionally, you'll get somebody who's like some kind of really well-known superstar, you know, who is paid a really high salary. But by and large, especially women of color, are the lowest paid academics. And so this is just not true. There's so much research that has been done that shows that it is not cost. What it is, is our inability to do research, to widen our understanding of quality, to um, realize that especially, you know, people of color do not always get the same kinds of opportunities and also have the same kind of social capital that allows them to have the, have the advisor that, you know, we just assume produces the best candidates. By the way, I did. I wanted, wanted to end my little spiel here by saying that two things that I found in doing this research that were the number one and number two ways that you acquire a faculty position are where you went and who your advisor was. Even if you don't have peer-reviewed articles coming out of your PhD program, if you have the right advisor and went to one of about 10 institutions, you typically can get a job over a person of color who has several peer-reviewed articles because people assume that if your advisor was successful, you're successful. And that's sort of that perpetuation of privilege. And because the professoriate is 76% white, it's a perpetuation, perpetuation sorry, uh, that was a lot of peace of um, whiteness. So um, those are some of the things that I talk about in the book. Happy, I did that very quickly, but I'm happy to um, expand on anything that I can. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, for this. Um, I think you just encouraged all of us to go out and get this book because it sounds really useful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so 
I, you know, I took a couple of notes on things that kind of stood out to me as you were talking. And I think the first question I want to ask, um, what are the benefits of hiring a diverse faculty? You said there's benefits to it, but you didn't kind of expound on why. And it seems to me that a big part of pushback is people don't believe that there's a benefit. You know, I hear this, I'm in Florida, so we just want the best person regardless of color, right? Which is an excuse to hire another white guy, um, right. which is what usually right. happens. So why diversify the faculty? Right, so um, typically I read this little story when people ask me this question, but it's across my room over there. So I, I, I don't know if I can grab it, but here's the thing. We, if we don't hire a diverse faculty, and we continue to have a professoriate that's 76% white at major research institutions, even more white, we have no idea what the best is because we have a limited view of the best. We have this small, tiny view of what the best is and it's based on whiteness because we don't let other people in. You know, so like, I, we, we don't know what the most profound research is, the most um, compelling research, the, you know, the, the, the research that really, really moves us to new levels until we bring in a more diverse professoriate. And it's, it's the same thing, you know, I, I had somebody ask me that question at, in, in front of about a thousand people. And he said, you know, if you, let's say I'm hiring an architect for a building, why can't I just hire the best architect? And I gave him the same answer. I said, you have no idea if you don't have a diverse group of architects, how beautiful your building could be, how structurally sound it could be, how innovative it could be, how sustainable it could be, because you're limiting to artists who have basically come up through a system that privilege them the entire way along. So sometimes you have to look more broadly because we have to remember that these systems are privileging people. Um, you know, like I, I had, I talked to people for this book who told me they would never hire anybody who got a PhD from a historically black college. You know, and I said, you wouldn't hire anybody who got a PhD from Howard. And they said, no, that, and I said, well, why not? Well, they're not of the same quality. And I said, well, can you give me some research that shows me that they couldn't, they can't. And from my vantage point, as someone who's been doing work related to HBCUs for a long time, I don't know if any of you ever met a PhD from Howard, but I certainly wouldn't tell that person that. And I certainly would never, ever believe that to be true. I also think, you know, I asked the same question about many um, uh, Hispanic serving institutions across the country who are producing amazing doctoral students. And people said the same thing. People point blank said to me, if they don't go to an AAU, which are the premier research institutions, quality falls off. Okay. Now, how do they know that? They don't have any evidence because there's no evidence of that. So um, I think that for me, um, I, I tend to push back at people because our definitions of quality are so small. Now, one other thing, we, we know that the student population in the country is rapidly, rapidly becoming majority students of color, okay? Just at a very rapid rate. And we know by 2050, it'll probably be almost, the country will be and who's in school. And I mean, we, we know that the majority of kindergartners and public high school students are people of color. We owe it to these individuals to have a diverse faculty. So it's not only for research, it's not only there's a moral imperative, which doesn't always convince people. We need to do this for our students. And I actually think we need to do it for ourselves. Um, you know, sometimes, some, sometimes people um, uh, will ask me why I love being a professor. One of the reasons I love being a professor is learning from so many people. And the majority of them in my life are people of color because of what I do. And I've learned so much and um, been able to collaborate with just some amazing, amazing people from a whole variety of places. And so those are some of the reasons that I think are really, really important. I do wanna say, this is a hard conversation for some white people because they know that they have had too much for a long time. 
and that in order to to be more inclusive, they're going to have to give something up and they don't want to do it. And I'd say that that's happening in the country overall right now, but it's also happening in the academy where people know they've had more than their share. And so part of part of bringing people into, you know, people of color into the academy is that you have to share, you have to give, you have to be generous. This, these are not words that are used in conjunction with higher education, but this is what has to happen in order for you know, people to have a good experience within higher education as faculty. It's it's really, really important to do that. I mean, for me, the moral imperative is good enough, right? That's good enough, but for most people, it, it just isn't. And I, I don't think we can be excellent universities unless we are diverse universities. I don't think we can be. Yeah, this whole, what you just talked about, the whole time I was thinking, gosh, this sounds a lot like what Edward Said wrote in his book on Demo democratic critique of humanism, where he talks about the need to inter internationalize our humanities canon. Um, and I think, you know, I'm in Florida. So right now we've got this push to have classical education, but they're not talking about classical Chinese education, right. or classical African education. They're talking about classical Western education. Right. Right? And right. I get the impression that they think we're going to lose Shakespeare if we add uh, Chinua Akebi to right. the, to the, the the curriculum, or that we're going to lose, you know, Socrates if we add in Dreams of the Red Chamber from China, right? And I, I get the impression it's they think of it as a zero sum game yes. when it's not. But let me move on to the next question. Yeah. Um, I'm in Florida, right? Yeah. Right now, when you talked about monetary incentives, it's illegal to do what you just said in Florida. Yes, yes. So uh, you can't do anything to encourage diversity at all. You the, you will lose your job if you do. So can you talk a little bit about this pushback we're getting? Because it's not just Florida, right? It's generally around. So how do you approach this? And what would your suggestion be to people living in a place where actually diversifying is illegal? Okay, so... I'm going to say a couple things. There have been some things in our country that have been legal that are horrific, right? Like slavery, for example. It, it, horrific things that I think that if you didn't have people who stood up against those kinds of things, um, there's so many things that have been legal in our country or illegal, but shouldn't have been, that if it weren't for people standing up for them, we we would never have moved on, right? So for me, I think it's a couple of things. Um, I do think it's important that people are aware of their need, need to be aware of their safety. Okay, I do think that's really important. But I also think that there are things that you can do. You can join forces to um, uh, to uh, starve people of money. Okay, so money talks. So starving people of money. I mean, if you take a look at if you take a look at historically the bus boycotts, African Americans starved bus companies of money, right? Money matters. So there are ways to do that. If you're in organizations, tell them not to to have their meetings in Florida. If you're you know, if there are ways to move things out of Florida to show, I'm just using Florida as an example, you could go to Tennessee or Texas or, you know, there are many other areas. You have to use your money. That's one thing. I think it's important to support organizations like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that has done profound work throughout history and today. I mean, talk about amazing, amazing work. I think it's important to support that, okay? that I'm just gonna say, I give to them every year, my daughter gives to them every year. It is incredibly important to support organizations like that who have attorneys who are fighting these kinds of things. I think that, um, I don't think we should acquiesce. I don't think we should acquiesce. And those of us in states where we don't feel pressured um, need to be speaking up, right? We shouldn't be, I, I don't think we should ever get to the point where we feel like, well, this is how it's going to be, because the people who want to um, to limit the curriculum are 
counting on that. They are banking on that. And quite frankly, they're probably right. They're probably right because most people will acquiesce. I do want to say, you know, as somebody who speaks out regularly, it is, it's not fun when people come for you. I mean, I have had death threats. I have had people threaten to kill me, to kill me, stab me, and play with my blood. Those are the exact words. Have threatened my family, all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I use the sources that I have at my university to protect me. I'm willing to call and um, I call and report those kinds of things. I, I'm not going to lie and say that it's not dangerous when you do work related to systemic racism or social justice or, you know, it, it is. It's, it can be very, very dangerous. But we cannot acquiesce to, to this, you know. I, I'm so proud that my daughter went to Philadelphia public schools and had an African-American history curriculum in every grade. I'm so proud of that. And, and she also, you know, went to highly diverse schools where she learned from highly diverse teachers. So, so important. And, um, you know, I, I want, I'd love for every student to have that. I, I would really, really, I think that's incredibly important. And um, we, but we have to fight for that. I'll tell you something else people can do. You know, this is, people get mad at me when I say this, but white people, you need to stop leaving cities and, um, you know, send your kids to to schools in in public, you know, in cities. Right. Because money follows white people. That's how our country works. That's how systemic racism. I'm, I'm getting a little off topic here, but I just want to say that that's how systemic racism works is that money follows white people. So it's that it's really important to be white people have to be central in this as well. It can't be left up to only people of color to be part of this fight. You know, white people feel like they have a choice. People of color don't have a choice. They have no choice in this. So it's it, to me, it's um, it's really, really important to to do that. And I understand it's different depending on where you are. I, I listen, I'm fully aware that I'm so lucky to, to be at a university in New Jersey where we have a governor who cares about these things. We have a mandatory African-American curriculum. We have a mandatory Asian-American curriculum. I mean, we have these things that are really, really important. We care about LGBTQ families. Um, I, but I, no matter where I am, I, I believe because I've lived in Texas and Georgia and all kinds of other places, I would, um, you know, I feel like it's really important. Sorry to get on a little soapbox there, but I feel so passionately about, about that it is, it is really important that we be a part of this, this work. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth because I can see the chat room is blowing up. Yes, there's just been several comments, no questions per se, but uh, people really are resonating with what you say, Mary Beth. Thank you so much for that. Um, one of the questions we got in um, in the registration questions was about um, practical interventions that can be done in the moment when you witness um, racism happening, say, in, a, in the interview process. Can you speak to that? Like, what is a way to intervene and hold people to account? Sure. And um, so... I, you know, I was at a DEI event all day yesterday for faculty, and it was really interesting because the um, uh, facilitator, I, I like what she said. She said, you know, rather than call people out, call people in. And I've always felt very strongly about this. When something comes up, I try to take care of both people, right? The person who objects and the person who said whatever it was, because if you don't, the person who offended will keep offending. They'll, they'll go off in a huff and keep offending. And so here's something that I would say, like, I'll just give you an example of something. So I, I this happened to me. So I'm in a, I'm in a faculty search committee meeting. Um, and uh, I, somebody said, you know, I really care about diversity, but I don't know. I'm worried about quality. If we, if we bring in some, you know, a a, di a diverse group of candidates. I'm really worried about quality. Now, here's what I would do in that situation and have done. I would say, um, because I want, first of all, I need you all to know that's a racist comment. That's just pure 
racism, systemic racism, just right out, right, right out there in the open. So what I typically will say to people is, can you help me understand why when we're having a conversation about diversity, quality comes up? And normally the person will sit there for a minute and start thinking, okay, wait a minute. You know, like they'll, they'll start to think. And so then I'll say, I think that the only time quality should come up when we're talking about diversity is if we're thinking that we're going to be of a higher quality, the more diverse we are. And that, that isn't that to me, I, I didn't call the person racist. Now I have done that in the past, but, but, um, but I will say I didn't call the person racist, but what I did is I got them to think about it. Now, if somebody is doing something like I have also witnessed people, and these are at all different institutions, witnessed people try to change the bylaws in a meeting to um, get to to do something that reinforces systemic racism. In those cases, I would raise my hand and I would say, um, uh, I need to point out that what we are doing right now is uh, we are reinforcing systemic racism to ensure that we don't bring in a diverse faculty. I just wanna make sure everybody in the room knows and understands how this is happening. Now, when I have done that, typically what's happened is maybe one other person stood up with me and then three or four people sent me a nice email afterward, nice email telling me they were happy I did that. Um, and then most people didn't care. Um, so initially people might not care, but if you keep pushing back, eventually people will start to hold themselves accountable because this is what they'll do. They'll be like, well, you know, Mary Beth's on that committee. So that means that we're not gonna be able to get away with that. Do you, do you see? So, um, so nobody ever brings up quality during a diversity conversation in front of me anymore. They just don't do it, right? Because they know that I'm going to say something. They probably also know that I've said publicly that I believe that that's racist. So, um, so those are some things. Here's another thing. Um, this person won't come here because there aren't enough people of color. How do you know that? How do you know that? That happens all the time. We don't have any evidence of that. This person won't come here because we don't have a good climate. Well, who controls that? Y'all do, right? And I tell people, I'm like, if you do you need that means you need to do some house cleaning. You need to get the work done and you need to change the way that you're operating. Um, but should we penalize this person because of our own problems? Um, the salary thing comes up, and I typically will. I will bring out evidence and show, because I know the studies, they're in my book. You, you bring out evidence and show that that's not true. So it's good to have evidence to refute, but you also need people who are willing to stand up and say something. And then one last thing about this. Most people are afraid to stand up for justice. They just are. They're afraid. They're afraid nobody will like them. Their colleagues won't be their friend. Why would you want to be friends with anybody who doesn't care about justice? Why would you want to have friends that would reinforce systemic racism? <laughs> like, why do you want them as your friends? I don't. I mean, so, so basically you have to say to yourself, am I willing to do this because I care about systemic, uh, you know, about fostering an end to systemic racism and am I willing to maybe lose a few friends? I'll bet you that you will not lose anybody. I, I bet you, you won't. And I, I think you might even gain some friends. You might even gain some friends. Um, well, can you talk? Because I, in my experience, it's not just about being liked, or um, but it's also about power dynamics. So that yes. you're at risk. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so if you're, say, a tenure track faculty going up for tenure in a couple of years, and you know that, uh, you know, the fat department chair is leaning towards the white candidate, um, it, you know, it's that it's those kind of relationships, I think, the more that, that power dynamic. Yeah, okay, so there's a couple things. Now, I'll tell you, now, if you're a tenured faculty member, you need to, and there are junior faculty on that committee, especially junior faculty of color, you got to take care of them. Like you need to make sure they have an opportunity to talk. One thing I, a strategy I use is um, I don't talk first. Like as a senior person, I always, like if I'm leading, I'll always go to the junior people first. 
But if I'm not leading, when it, when someone asks me to talk, I'll say, hmm, you know, could, could so-and-so, I'd really love to hear from so-and-so right over here. And I will try to get the junior people to talk. I also will tell them if they're uncomfortable, I'm happy to co-sign something as long as I, you know, which I typically would probably, most of the time, it's not that controversial. What it's usually, it's usually a junior person who's a person of color who comes to me and says, I want to bring this up, but I'm afraid. So I'll say to them, bring it up and I'll co-sign it, you know, and it doesn't do it doesn't do anything to me to do that right but it really really helps them to have somebody to say well oh, i i agree you know i think that's a really good point so su support each other that that's important um if you are on a committee and there are senior faculty acting up as a senior faculty member you got to say something you know you you got to say something so for example, let's say I was on a committee and there were a couple, uh, again, this is just a, an example, a couple white men on a committee who had very traditional views. I might say, you know, I just, I just, you could say you finished reading a book. I'd say I finished writing a book. I just finished writing a, writing a book that talks about how we reinforce whiteness and end up hiring the same people over and over because we're only interested in certain institutions and people with famous advisors. So let's see if we can avoid that and think a little bit differently. So I might, as a senior person, push back. And um, those are things that, that we have to do. I think it's important that committees have um, sort of like somebody who's uh, taking a look at the actual actions of the committee on them. It's good to have kind of reps that do that. I also think that if somebody is um, really, really controlling, that you might have to talk to a dean. You might have to you might have to go and have a conversation if that's taking place. I mean, and and deans need to step up and make sure that there's equity in those committees. I do think that junior faculty are very vulnerable on search committees. It's very hard to speak up um, and uh, because you're worried that you are going to be retaliated against. And uh, it, I mean, I I haven't been a junior faculty in a long time, but I can still remember what it feel, felt like. You know, I remember I was I felt so vulnerable every single time I talked. My voice would crack because I was so afraid. And um, and so we have to protect each other. That's that I, I hate that I even have to say that. But we, we do because people in um, higher education have a lot of, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of power in these situations. Um, and Terrence just raised a really good point. Um, he said, I think one of the most important things among several that Mary Beth said is that white people have the opportunities to choose whether or not to do uh, right or not, whereas black people don't. Yeah, I, I don't think people of color in general um, uh, do. And um, I, I think that a lot of times white people just don't even consider this, right? They go out of their house in the morning and decide whether or not they actually are going to care about these injustices, whereas people of color don't have to care about that. And if, you know, sometimes I'll use this as an example just to get people thinking. I'm not equating this to the same thing, but I'm just going to, I try to get, especially white women, to think about this, okay? So think about what it's like as a white woman to walk down the street in the dark as a woman, but I'm just going to talk to white women. Um, you know, like I, I never walk down the street alone in the dark ever, but a white man doesn't have that much to worry about. You know, I try to explain to people that like um, that there are things as women that we have to worry about that men often don't have to worry about. We need to be cognizant that there are things that people of color have to worry about that we have the luxury of not worrying about. You know, I saw some. I saw a um, survey recently that asked women overall what would be the first thing they would do if there were no men in the world, and the answer was walk outside at night alone. And you can read into that anything you want, but for me, that that resonates, right? And I just think about like how that plays out in the lives of people of color, how they don't have a choice around these issues. 
you know, um, and and we as white folks, we we do um, we we have a we have a choice. And for me, I think we need to make the right choice, which is you you have to stand up for these things, and you also have to be listening to people of color as well. You know, you have to listen and um, and ask people um, what works best for them. Can I just follow up on that and see if you can give advice? Um, you know, as a white woman who's gone in and done like diversity and encouragement training in white spaces, um, the thing I hear is that people are afraid to stand up on behalf of their black colleagues or their brown colleagues or their Asian colleagues because they're afraid they're going to make a faux pas or a misstep. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they don't just they don't do it at all. And that creates like a vicious cycle, right? Um, that people aren't supported and they don't feel like this person is a safe person, even though philosophically this person is aligned, they don't step up. Do you have advice on how to help people overcome their fear of being an ally openly? Sure. Okay. So there are a whole bunch of thing I, I like I was in this DEI thing yesterday and a lot of white people were saying that right so so here's a couple of things um number one we all need to give each other a little more grace to make mistakes okay mistakes happen the second thing is that um you're going to make mistakes we all do we all make them we all say the same thing uh I mean we I mean, not the same thing we all say things that we we wish we wouldn't have said um, and, um, so it, it, you, I, I would urge people to take a chance. I have always found, and, you know, I will say that the majority of communities that I'm in on a daily basis are people of color. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I live in a diverse area. I live in a diverse city. My, I, I run a center that most of the people are people of color who work there. Um, you know, the, all of my, my closest friends are almost all but one people of color. I, I feel very, very, very comfortable. Do I ever make a mistake? I'm sure that I do. Would they tell me? Yes, they would lovingly. Right. And would I want them to tell me? Yes, I would want them to tell me. And um, and I think part of it is it's OK when someone corrects you. You know, um, there's a woman, um, her name is Terry Gibbons. She wrote this book called Radical Empathy. And it has to do with like, you know, lovingly correcting people who who, you know, probably are trying their best. They might not be, not everybody is, by the way. Some people like it the way it is. Um, but I think there are ways that we can do that. We can do that. Uh, and and I think, I, I, how do I say this? Um, I really, I hate when I hear people say that, right? I hate when I hear people say, I'm afraid because I'm afraid I'm gonna say the wrong thing. I mean, you know, like that just runs antithetical to us as researchers. A lot of times we do research and our projects don't come out right. Our scientific experiments fail. Why are we so afraid to fail in this situation, right? I think because white people are just, just so afraid of being called a racist. And you know, at the end of the day, if you end up being called a racist, okay, maybe you'll learn something and maybe you'll become a better person and maybe you'll change your ways. And that, that helps everybody, especially people of color. I mean, that helps everybody. So I, I think, I, I hope that white people can get beyond that, but I hear it all the time. And then, you know, so here's one, one thing I want to say too. Imagine being a person of color and, and having to deal with racism on a daily basis. I'd be much more afraid of that than speaking up and having and doing it the wrong way <laughs> you know i mean i think like just think about that for a minute having to deal with racism every single day yesterday one of my friends who's asian american told me that he doesn't wear a mask on public transportation because he is so afraid that someone will only see his eyes and lash out at him and not see his smile can you imagine right can you imagine that and I'm, I'm sure some of you can. So I, I think that we have to think like, is it really that hard? Is it really that hard? Would it really be that terrible for someone to tell us that we said something the wrong way? Like we just say, I'm sorry. And then 
and then, you know, do better. That's what, that's what you got to do. That's what we teach our kids. <laughs> so, you know, say, I'm sorry and do better. Um, thank you. Uh, so another question that we got in the, the pre-registration was um, about how can, how to create more inclusive job descriptions and selection criteria. So kind of at the front end of the search yeah. process. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually a really big issue because most people just recycle the same jobs and send them out and they really don't send them out to very many people as well. And so um, what you want to do is you want to have inclusive language. You want to have a variety of people look at it. If you don't have that many people of color, you know, I, I would always have some people of color look at it. I just think that that's really important. But, you know, if you're not very diverse, then that means reaching out to a colleague at another institution and saying, hey, we're looking to attract people. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Do you think that I would be able to attract a diverse group of people with this ad? And, you know, especially if someone has expertise, don't ask someone if you don't think they have expertise. But I mean, I know people who I could ask that. I think I could write the ad myself, but I always ask people, hey, what do you think of this? Do you think I could attract some of your students with this? Because that person might um, produce quite a few people of color. And, and, you know, is there anything offensive in this that would offend you that might offend your students? Just ask. Um, and and so that's that's really important to, to do that work. I also think, you know, be broader. Be broader with your ads. Don't be super um, specific um, because sometimes people will self-select out. I also talk about the community. What kind of community are you in? Right? You know, if there if it's like for example, I live in Philadelphia, but um if a university in Philadelphia were um looking for faculty, talk about the amazing like let's say they wanted to bring in more African American faculty. Talk about the amazing history of African American culture and and history in Philly. You know, like, or of the vast diversity here. I mean, it's so diverse in every single way that you can possibly think of. Talk about that. Talk about the rich history, culture, art, all of that matters. I mean, that would matter to me too, right? But like that matters. And though there are ways you can bring that into an ad that talks about how your institution builds on the rich diversity in the, in the community. People like to see that. Okay. Thank you so much. I really like those very practical, concrete um, tips. Um, so another question that we got um, is, how do you, uh, what can we do to eliminate implicit bias in the hiring process? Um, okay, so it, implicit, right? Yeah, so I tend to be somebody who thinks that most bias is explicit and that we call it implicit. Um, however, I, I'll answer the question. So I think, um, again, you, you have to do things like ask the question about why are we privileging only certain institutions? Ask the question about why is it okay for this candidate not to have any publications just because they had this person as an advisor? You got to ask those questions. You got to ask the question um, let's say you had two people who were doing some kind of quantitative research and one of them used like a critical approach and you had some of the faculty saying, well, you know, that's not rigorous. You got to push back, right? Because a critical approach to quantitative data, that's pretty cutting edge right now. You know, that's actually a good, I mean, in Florida, you can't even use the word critical, I think, anymore. But but um, I was just uh, quoted in an article about that um, for the Financial Times. But, but basically, you know, if you're in a state where you can use critical, critical is fairly cutting edge. So you need people to talk about why it's important to question numbers, right? That numbers are not just these things that have nothing attached to them. Numbers have meaning. So, you know, you, you have to bring those kinds of things up. I once, I'll tell you kind of a funny little story. Of, um, I was once talking to these faculty who told me they could only hire faculty from Ivy League institutions. So I went around the room who got their PhDs from Ivy Leagues. I went around the room and I asked them all where they got their PhDs. There was only one person who was about 80 years old who got their PhD from Princeton. Everybody else got their PhD from a non-Ivy League. So I said, why are you holding, because they said they couldn't hire people of color because none of them had PhDs from Ivy Leagues, which is not true. But 
And I said, why are you holding people of color to this standard? And they said, well, because that's where we want our faculty to come from. I said, but you don't have one person in this room who has an Ivy League degree, right? And so sometimes you got to push back at things like that. Um, and that could be a dean. It could be because people want to up their U.S. News and World Report rankings. There are all kinds of things like that. You have to you have to push back at those kinds of little things. You also, you know, I also was in a meeting one time, a search committee, where someone said, "I don't think we should hire that person because they have tattoos all over their arms. They might be a gang member." Okay. Now, of course, I want you to think about that for a minute. That that's just terrible, right? Like, what 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 the heck is going on there? Um, and you need to say something, right? Now the candidate happened to be Latino. So there was racism involved in that, probably some classism, probably some all kinds of stuff going on there. You have to say something to that. And um, and that means, you know, again, again, speaking up. But a lot of, you know, how we see people comes out in who we deem as being qualified. And that could have to do with the way people look, their hair. If they maybe they had tattoos, the way they dress, the way they speak, all of those region of the country, we know that there are biases against people with southern accents in faculty searches. Um, you got to speak up and and talk about the actual work that they're doing, the actual contributions. This takes some bravery. It shouldn't. Yeah. It shouldn't. Well, we should just all do this. Okay, so, also, we, so um, just real quick, we're at um, twelve fifty-seven, so we only have a few minutes left. Let's take one more question. I think Terrence has a really good one, and then we'll wrap it up. Great. Uh, so Terrence asks, "Can Mary Beth speak on power, violence, mental health, the effects of toll, and fighting the power and violence of racism, injustice, and fairness?" Ooh, that's a lot in two minutes, but um, but um. I mean, one thing I do, I think we should really, really have to keep, we, we need to keep in mind is the toll that what's happening in the nation right now, even though our history is also you know, riddled with all of this, it is very difficult for faculty of color right now, incredibly difficult. Um, think about what's, go, what's going on where people around the country are telling people of color, your history, your culture, your being is not important. It is not central to history. It's not central to curriculum. All of that matters, right? And, and just all of, um, I, I always try to tell people that when, when most of us are feeling pain, People of color are feeling even more pain, right? Because there are fewer systems to support people of color in general because we have a history of systemic racism. Um, I think we need to be uh, encouraging people to, to pay attention to their mental health, to work on their mental health. You know, yesterday I had a staff member who came in and she just did not look like an African-American woman. She did not look like it was her best day. And I told her, I said, you know what? I think you need to go home, just sleep the whole day. I knew that she was in pain. And I just, I told her, I knew some things had been happening in her life outside of work. Go home, it, take, take some time off. I told her not to come back till Tuesday. I just, I was like, just don't come back take care of yourself. We've got to check on each other to make sure that um, these things don't, you know, people, people die from this kind of stuff. And it's really, really important that we check on each other. Terrence, I'm so, I'm so sad that I don't have more time to explain that. I'm not an expert on mental health, but I do go to a mental health counselor and it's the best thing I ever did for myself. <laughs> so, so um, thank you so much, Mary Beth. Um, Welcome. I want to thank everybody who joined us today and participated in our session. Um, if you enjoyed the program, you want to learn more, you want to get more involved in humanistic management and humanistic leadership approaches to changing the world, um, one business at a time and people at a time, uh, please consider becoming a member at humanisticmanagement.international. Um, and there's a link to our membership site there. You're going to be supporting the, the work that we do, uh, but you'll also get some benefits like if you have a book coming out you can post about it in our membership site and let people know about it um so i want to thank you and encourage you all to join mary beth do you have any final words for us um i i think that we should um all care more about each other and about the lives of each other 
and not, um, you know, just care about ourselves. There's a wonderful book by Lisa Delpit called Other People's Children. And it has to do with the fact that we have to care about others in order to, to live in a society that um, is good for all of us. And far too many of us only care about our, ourselves. And so I would just urge you, um, I would urge you to try to care about other people as well. And this was great. Thank you. I love talking with all of you. Oh, we really appreciate you coming on to discuss this with us. Thanks You're everyone welcome. again. This has been the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn for May, 2023. We will be back in the fall. Thanks so much. Bye everybody.